Squad Vancouver. Pre-game, post-game, every game presented by Bodog from Sports Odds to free casino games. Make a play at Bodog.net. Wadden and J-Pat here with you to wrap up the week. J-Pat, an exciting week of hockey action in the uh, Stanley Cup playoffs. Of course, we'll get to what we saw last night a little bit later on here. However, I don't know if this caused a stir in Vancouver. The Norris Trophy finalists were announced yesterday. Quinn Hughes was not among the three finalists. However, I don't see a lot of angst coming out of Vancouver right now. Well, and nor should there be. And for a lot of the same reasons that we talked about Elias Pettersson the other day, Quinn Hughes is one of the best defensemen in the National Hockey League. Is he one of the three best defensemen in the National Hockey League? Some people would say yes. But again, when the final tally come out, uh, comes out after the award show, you know, we may find out that Quinn Hughes was on a lot of ballots, but just not enough to be one of the three finalists. So I do think someday he'll be a finalist. I, I still, you know, I reserve the right to wonder if he'll ever win the Norris. Will he put together that one season that is, you know, seen by everybody around the league that has a vote as that much better than anybody else? And, you know, how many times have we talked about uh, the golden age of young defensemen? And then, of course, you got the uh, the great beard and Eric Carlson, who went off and had his 100-point season as well. So, uh, you know, fascinating. It's going to be interesting to see how it all shakes down. And, you know, like, you know, can some people in the Canucks fan base be upset that Quinn Hughes wasn't a finalist? I suppose. I mean, the guy put together an incredible season, but so did Josh Morrissey. Yep. And so did Dougie Hamilton. And so did Rasmus Dahlin in Buffalo and Miro Heiskanen. And on and on it goes, this list of players Uh, this year kind of felt like a nod to guys that are in the club already, right? Like uh, Eric Carlson, Adam Fox. And I guess if there was one that you could quarrel with a little bit, and please hear me when I say this, I don't want this thrown back at me in social. Uh Kale McCarr is one of the best defensemen in the National Hockey League. But did he play enough games this year to, to really be seen as having a season that was so much better than some of those guys that I just mentioned. Kale McCarr was limited to 60 games. Yeah, he was a point a game, better than a point a game, 66 points in 60 games. Kale McCarr, again, I repeat, is one of the best defensemen in the National Hockey League. Some would say, without a doubt, he's the best defenseman in the NHL. I don't know what you, I just think availability is part of these year-end awards. Like, you can't be a part-time player, in my mind, and still be a league, I mean, I guess you can because he is, but I, I, I'm not sure that you can be a, an award winner if you only play 75% of your team's games. Like being there, being available, being healthy, all those types of things to me factor in. So, uh, again, I say it one more time Kale McCarr, incredible defenseman. I'm just not sure that this season his year was better than a lot of these other guys that I thought stepped up and and certainly had played themselves into the conversation. Yeah, 1.1 points per game, which is second to Eric Carlson at 1.23. But you're right, he only played 60 of 82 games. Is that enough to qualify, especially when you see the seasons that Josh Morrissey had, that Quinn Hughes had as well? You can quibble with Adam Fox, I believe, uh, being one of these nominees as well. Now, Carlson was first in points. 101, right? McCarr, as I mentioned, was second in points per game. Fox was eighth in points. It's kind of interesting. And when you look at the defensive metrics, you know, Corsi four percentage, Carlson, McCarr, Fox, all better than Quinn Hughes. And goals four percentage, Fox and McCarr were better than Quinn Hughes and Eric Carlson as well. So, you know, you can look at that side. To me, I think Josh Morrissey probably has the best case of somebody that got snubbed. But I'm there with them, with others, if they agree that Quinn Hughes should have been part of this. In fact, I believe I said on this podcast that he would have been one of my finalists. And as I dig deeper into this, maybe he would have been fourth. Like maybe to maybe Josh Morrissey to me deserves to be in there. In my opinion, over Fox, over McCarr. It depends on where you want to go with McCarr. If you thought that he played enough, because you're right. He like he is one of the best defensemen in the NHL. In fact, I put money on him to win the heart early this season because I thought he was going to have that kind of season. Now, of course, the injuries derailed that a little bit. But to me, I think the biggest snub is Josh Morrissey. But I think you can state a case for Quinn Hughes as well. Yeah. And yet I would go and say a guy like Rasmus Dahlin. Sure. Uh, but Buffalo didn't make the playoffs and Vancouver didn't make the playoffs. And I, and I do think now Eric Carlson, <laughs> San Jose certainly didn't make the playoffs. So I have to be careful in what I say here. But Carlson separated himself, uh, I mean, 25 points better than anybody. And yet I know a lot of pushback about, yeah, but it's a defenseman award. Like, how good was he defensively? Well, if he's 
contributing 101 points. Obviously, he's got the puck, and the Sharks had the puck in the offensive end an awful lot. But, I mean, if you just want to go plus minus, he's minus 26. So, like, there are some that think Eric Carlson has no business being in this conversation, and yet he put up 101 points from the defensive position at the very least, uh, even though he plays like more of a rover. I just look at Rasmus Dahlin, though, because I think, you know, one of the knocks we all have on Quinn Hughes is, oh, seven goals. And if you look at anybody in the top 10 of scoring among defensemen in the National Hockey League, only guy in single digits, like what if Quinn Hughes had had Rasmus Dahlin's numbers? Uh, Hughes had three more points than Rasmus Dahlin, but Dahlin had 15 goals to Quinn Hughes's seven. So Dahlin had 15 goals, 58 assists, 73 points. 92 penalty minutes, like pretty well-rounded uh, across the board. But again, he plays on a team that missed the playoffs yet again. They're going to get there. I mean, they've just got too many pieces that at some point, uh, you know, now they've got uh, Devin Levi, They maybe they've got the goaltending that they're looking for. Uh, whatever the case, uh, you know, I thought Rasmus Dahlin had an incredible season, but he's on a team that didn't make the playoffs. Uh, you know, I, Miro Heiskanen, you've heard me talk about him an awful lot. And I do, like, I just marvel at watching the guy and the way that he skates but I think he's kind of like Quinn Hughes. Like I think he's going to be a perennial guy that's in the conversation and gets some consideration. Is he ever going to put together that one season, though, that puts him over the top? And Are we know, not I, looking I, enough at Quinn Hughes' 69 assists, though? Remember how we talked about that 70 mark and how elusive that is for NHL defensemen? I know he didn't hit it, yep. but he was right up against it. Are we not putting... I know you, you put some stock into the goals. I think 69 assists uh, is a big talking point, though. Right, but I, I just, is it, like, for people that I don't have a vote, but, you know, this is a defensive award. Damn shame award. that you don't. We'll get you one next year. <laughs> but but this is an award for top defensemen. I don't know how many people are putting stock in the number of assists. Now, maybe they should, but they I, should. Think there are, I think there are other metrics. I, I just think there are other metrics that would get used. Uh, and, look, there, you know, there's no handbook on voting. Uh, the guys that have the votes, the men and women in the Professional Hockey Writers Association, like, you know, there's no guidelines. Nobody's told, hey, this is how you have to assess these players. And so some use the eye test. Many will use, uh, you know, the the information and the data that's available. Um, and, you know, I, I just think now we're in a time, day and age where there are more metrics available that can truly assess a guy's defensive impact on the game, like for years. I think a lot of times it was just the highest scoring defenseman. Oh, well, he must have had the best season. He had the most points. Uh, therefore, he gets the Norris. Uh, it's not that way at all. And I think we have numbers now that can isolate a guy's impact, uh, you know, on his own, but with teammates and in certain situations and all that kind of stuff. So I, I think most of the voters do put in the work and it's going to be fascinating to see, like, do people kind of fall in love with Eric Carlson's 101 points and just say, you know, for his faults, and for his team's fault, this was such an incredible season by one guy at that position that that's enough. Or, you know, obviously, Kale McCarr got enough love playing just 60 games. But, you know, I don't know that there should be a threshold, but I also think that there does have to be some consideration into, uh, you know, I mean, like, what's the number? Like, if he only played half of Colorado's games, he couldn't have, there's no way, right? So, what is that magic number that allows you to take him into consideration playing 75% of their games as opposed to 50% of their games? Uh, I don't know. Like, probably that. It's He's probably at the bare minimum at 60, I think. 60? Yeah. yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Especially with the numbers that he put up. You know, what is he going to get 66 points in 60 games? What about this with Carlson, though? As we look at goals, four percentage at five on five. He's 96-96. So he's 50%. Yeah. It, do you look at that as a good thing because of the fact that he plays on such a terrible team as San Jose? I mean, that's what, yeah, I go back to that point. Like, putting up 101 points, like, you've got to be spending an incredible amount of time in the offensive zone. And if you are, then in theory, teams shouldn't be in your defensive zone. But he plays so much, and he does play in all situations. But San Jose did go up an awful lot. I know that uh, goaltending was an issue there as well. Like, while he's on the ice, high dangers are over, 50, like, at 55%, scoring chances at 54%, expected goals at close to 50 or 53.5%. Like, so he's, like, things are going positively when Eric Carlson is on the ice. Right. And, and on a team I, that is that is is really bad. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where I come back to, like, the, the information that's available now can sort of isolate a guy's yeah. impact. So I think you have to think of it in terms of the Sharks were terrible. Carlson was incredible. Like, 
you know, how good were they when he was on the ice as opposed to what happened when he wasn't on the ice yeah. uh, for the San Jose Sharks? And I haven't gone deep into the numbers. Again, I don't have a vote, but I think uh, it would tell you for a guy that put up 101 points, my guess is the numbers were not pretty when Eric Carlson was not yeah. on the ice for San Jose this season. Yeah. So again, you know, you can look at that dash 26 perhaps and go, what the, what do you mean, Eric Carlson? But then you just got to dig a little bit deeper. That's why we look under the hood, right? We love doing that. Uh, we put out a poll question yesterday, right after the um, finalists were announced. Are you surprised that Quinn Hughes wasn't one of the three finalists for the Norris Trophy? j Pat, I thought for sure this was just going to be an overwhelming yes. And Canuck <laughs> fans are going to be out with the pitchforks and all that stuff. It's actually no. 75% of the people are saying no. And for, I think, a lot of the stuff we just unpacked there. Some people saying Eastern bias. And maybe there is. Maybe there is with Adam Fox. A little bit, because I think if you're Josh Morrissey, you're sitting around going like, hey, guys, like, hello, yeah. <laughs> Winnipeg, we're part of the NHL. But I'm really surprised that the fans went no. Are you? Um, a little bit. Yeah. Just for, as you said, uh, I mean, we're a podcast that focuses on the Canucks and most of our listeners, I think, would be pretty hardcore Canuck fans. But I also think that they're pretty savvy. And I, I think hopefully they would buy into a lot of the logic that we presented there. And again, there is nothing wrong if Quinn Hughes is the fourth best defenseman in the National Hockey League. He's a Vancouver Canuck and will be for the foreseeable future. And that's an incredible piece to have uh, on your roster. So it's now a question of what does he have to do to make that jump? And I think he's close. I think he's on the periphery, certainly. Uh, again, I want to see what the final vote tallies are. How many votes did he get? Uh, where did he stack up in all of this? But clearly not enough to be one of the three finalists when the awards are handed out in Nashville during draft week. But, you know, like, you know, we've gone, what, 10 minutes here talking about uh, possible candidates and we're seeing it in the playoffs as well. Like nobody talks about Brandon Montour and the season that he had. And he's up his game here in the playoffs. He had 73 points. He was three points behind Quinn Hughes in the regular season. And think about uh, how much love we've poured on a guy like Quinn Hughes. So, you know, Dougie Hamilton doesn't get a ton of love. He played all 82 games for a really good New Jersey team that, uh, you know, made incredible strides this season. So the the list is so long. Like, uh, it's just, it's a tough chore to, to pare it down to just three. But uh, the three that they went with, Carlson Fox and Kale McCarr, let's see how it all shakes down. Uh, head over to uh, Twitter, at Van. If you're not uh, giving us a follow, please do already. And if you want to uh, vote on the poll, you can do that. Leave a comment, too. We'd love to uh, get that from you. Uh, Abbotsford Canucks tonight, game mm. four. Calgary leads that series, of course, two games to one. All games have been one goal games. I think that's something that you can really pull from this. If you are an Abbey Canucks fan, they took the first two games to overtime in Calgary. Calgary able to prevail. And then on Wednesday, Abbey uh, gets that 3-2 victory. So trying to extend the series to five tonight in what will be a rocking building down in Abbotsford. Yeah, unfortunately not going to be able to make this one a previous uh, family commitment, but uh, have already made the pledge. If Abbotsford wins, I'm going back on Sunday Hi, baby. Uh, and looking forward to it. So uh, let's see how it all shakes down. Yeah, I mean, my, I'm not ready to see the hockey season end here uh, in Metro Vancouver out into the Fraser Valley. And I know that uh, tickets are uh, a hot commodity, so they're going to pack that place. And certainly they would again on Sunday uh, if they can extend it. But uh, yeah, I would think the belief has to be pretty high for Abbotsford. You know, at the outset of the series, the number one team in the American Hockey League, the MVP of the American Hockey League and Dustin Wolf, and, you know, Calgary started with those two games at home and did what they had to do to get the two victories. But if you're Jeremy Colton and you're Abbotsford, as you said, you force them to overtime in both of those games. Special teams weren't very good out on the road. Special teams were better on Wednesday night, and now you've got to win. And I think Abbotsford just has to, you know, they certainly can't look past tonight. Obviously, there is no tomorrow without a win tonight but they also have to know that you know if they sort of follow the game plan of the other night get another victory here now it's down to one game winner take all and you've got it on your own ice so even though you're lower seed you know this was how it all played out that there was this possibility that you could have home ice in the fifth and deciding game and that's what Abbotsford's playing for so it's gonna be tough I mean they have to win two more against the top seed in the American Hockey League that's not gonna be easy it is a heck of a hockey club and again, they've got this last line of defense. I didn't think Dustin Wolf was at the top of his game. That game winner slap shot off the rush off left wing. You know, and that's not a goal that he gives up an awful lot. So I'm sure he wants to tidy things up. And if you're Abbotsford, you know, all the hockey cliches about getting traffic, getting in front of him, take his eyes away, do those types of things. And when you get power play opportunities, find a way to cash in. So, uh, yeah, I hope it goes. I mean, I love the drama of deciding games at any level 
Uh, so uh, for a lot of reasons, I hope Abbotsford is able to, to get the job done and force this thing to the limit on Sunday evening well, out in Abbotsford. Where do you think they go with goaltending tonight since they've been doing the tandem thing? You think they just continue it? I do, although I was wrong the other day when I said, hey, go with Arthur Silovs as your team MVP the rest of the way. Yeah. Uh, and Jeremy Cullen went with Spencer Martin, and Martin was fine. Uh, he was named the first star. I didn't love the second goal that got past him. And I do wonder if even at that, if there's not much to choose between the two guys, like, is that enough for the door to be open? Even though he delivered a victory, he made a couple of key breakaway stops. Didn't love the second goal, but there wasn't a third goal. And that's what I did like about Spencer Martin's performance. So, um, yeah, Colleton's kind of, I mean, he said it repeatedly that he's got trust in both these guys, that it's a situation that neither one of them probably loves because they both want the net, but I think they both understand that they are both deserving of getting the nod. But if uh, you've gone with this rotation for the better part of six weeks, like I don't see it ending now. So, uh, yeah, let's, uh, I'm kind of looking forward to seeing what uh, the goaltending uh, decision is for the Abbotsford Canucks. Team Canada finally got announced, yeah. Jay Pat. <laughs> we were talking about this yesterday and how uh, we were surprised that just I haven't seen a roster yet. It is official now. And uh, the two lone Canucks we already knew about, uh, Ethan Bear, Tyler Myers are going to be on the blue line. A former Canuck in Tyler Toffoli is going to make uh, another appearance for Canada. And top prospect, uh, one of the top prospects that is not Connor Bernard, uh, Adam Fantilli of the University of Michigan, go blue, by the way, uh, is going to play for Team Canada as well. And there's some younger guys in there too. Cody Glass is going to play. Uh, we've got uh, Devon uh, Levi, uh, Sam, um, I guess Sam Montembo is not a, a young guy, but uh, there's going to be the goaltenders as well. But uh, also a, a veteran in Milan Lucic showing mm. up there. So a bit of a mix here uh, for Team Canada. I like Mackenzie Weger on the blue line too. And then a few names that maybe don't jump off the page to you. Yeah, it, look, it's not heavy on NHL star power, uh, which is disappointing. Uh, but at least there are some recognizable names. The U.S. put out its roster yesterday. Whew. Uh, I, I was like, who? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, Connor Garland is star power on that team. He might wear the C on that team. It's possible. <laughs> um, but for Canada, yeah, like I'm wondering, was the graphic designer away? Like, was he in Hawaii for a week or something and just like got back to the office and put something together? Like, it just, it seemed like it was so late in the day here to, <laughs> to get the roster out. I have to imagine that uh, they had approval and acceptance from a lot of these players. But for whatever reason, it took longer than usual to actually get the info out there. But we have it now. A uh, bit of a mixed bag. Uh, Andre Tournier of uh, Arizona, the head coach. DJ Smith, Ottawa's head coach, serving as an assistant. So uh, a couple of NHL head coaches uh, behind the bench for for this group of Team Canada. Yeah, Milan Lucic, like good for Lucic for answering the call of his country. Uh, big ice surface, not the most mobile guy. So it'll be interesting. And obviously, we know that uh, uh, the penalties, the game is called differently. Fighting isn't even a, a consideration. So you know, you don't think of Milan Lucic necessarily for international hockey, but I like the idea of him, uh, you know, the phone rang and he said yes, and probably the last opportunity in his career to to do something like this. So uh, it's always a mixed bag. It's about coming together and, you know, trying to play your way through the preliminary round so that uh, you're at the top of the game when uh, when the, the elimination round starts. It's impossible to handicap. I haven't even looked at some of the European rosters. We know uh, Elias Pettersson's not playing for Sweden, so that's a, a blow to to them. So, yeah, maybe it's wide open, but uh, we're a hockey country. You'd like to think that uh, whoever's wearing the Maple Leaf on their on the front of their jersey, you know, they know that there are expectations on Canada, and uh, there's enough talent in that lineup that uh, yeah, I'd like to think that uh, Canada has a shot, at the very least, of coming home with, with gold. You want to feel old? <laughs> I do Milan, every day, but <laughs> Milan Lucic will be 35 in June. <laughs> like that is unbelievable. I saw people batting around uh, whether the Canucks should should sign him next year. I know he's a UFA this off season. I mean, obviously, it would be cool for a local boy to to come home. I, I don't know. Do do you, would you see that? Could he fit? For, I mean, I, they can always use the toughness. I just wonder if whether the uh, the game is passing him by right now. Well, and there was always talk about uh, hometown guy Jim Benning and his connections with Boston, meat and potatoes. And, you know, so there have been links to the Canucks of Milan Lucic in the past. Um, at this stage of his career, I like, you know, is he an everyday player at 35 in a game that's getting faster all the time? I mean, the toughness is still undeniable and a uh, ton of respect for, you know, the way that he's played the game over the years. We know Rick Tockett earlier this week said that they need toughness so you know maybe i can't discount it entirely but uh it's not you know the Canucks don't have a whole lot of money i know that uh luch probably not looking to break the bank at this stage of his career but uh, I, I 
I don't see it happening, but maybe I'll be surprised. 77 games last year, which I'm surprised by. I thought he would have played less than that, but 19 points. He's played uh, 1,173 games. He's had That's a incredible. really long career. That is incredible. You know, when you say you want to feel old, I mean, obviously he was part of that Memorial Cup team in 2007. Yeah. We're 16 years removed from, right? from that. So uh, time does march on. There's uh, no doubt about it. Okay. The, no, not the final spin, actually. We're going to do one more on Monday when we do our uh, Monday pod ahead of the uh, NHL draft up, lottery. Yeah. So your turn today, and let's yeah. just recap for the people. We have done this every day since Monday. We've had Vancouver fall to 11th three times. Yesterday, they moved up nine spots to second. Ooh. We've had first uh, by Washington, Columbus, San Jose twice. So the Sharks are looking good right now. Mm -hmm. But, uh, of course, Washington moving all the way up. That was on Monday. That was fantastic. So today on Friday, J-Pat, your turn to spin the wheel of the NHL draft simulator. Go ahead, my friend. All right. Now, just a quick primer. Uh, in order of odds, Anaheim, Columbus, Chicago, San Jose, Montreal are your top five. And the Canucks sitting uh, at 3%. That is 11th. Uh, so uh, here we go as we hit the button, tankathon.com. And for the second time this week, the Columbus Blue Jackets wow. have won the draft lottery here on Rinkwide Vancouver. So Anaheim, uh, the odds not in their favor. Uh, again, 18.5%. Uh, you would have thought that one out of five this week that uh, the Ducks would have held, but uh, that's not the case. So Columbus moves to the top of the pack. Chicago moves Ooh. up a spot. And Anaheim uh, can't fall further than two places. So Anaheim... Uh, that's worst case scenario for them. They'll still get a really good player, but uh, the Ducks will go to the podium third and then everything else stays as is. So that keeps the Vancouver Canucks in that 11th spot in the first round of the draft. All right. So we'll do one more of these on Monday ahead of that. And uh, yeah, hopefully uh, the Canucks, at least we could just one out of six would be fantastic if they could just land that top spot. All right, we're joined by Patrick Johnson, as we do every Friday here from the province, Post Media. Are you in the shower right now, PJ? Sounds like you're <laughs> in the rain. From the, yeah, I've yeah. just oh, taken, okay. taken cover under uh, the awning of the, uh, the 100-year-old Mariloma Club here in uh, beautiful Kitsilano. Okay. Excellent. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure that uh, we weren't interrupting anything. No, it's, uh, things are good. I'm up for a while. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we were batting around Quinn Hughes not being one of the finalists, one of the three finalists for the Norris Trophy. Of course, you've got a vote. Yeah. So, hey, where did you where did, well, where did you go I'll with give this? a big reveal. He was fourth on my ballot. Okay. And, um, right. I picked a Hampus Lindholm, not even a finalist. I think deserving of more credit. I mean, I'm sure he was downgraded on some people because he was playing for this insanely good team. Um, but, I, you know, I just watched him play in the way he was just such a cog in that impressive machine. I, I thought deserved credit. I mean, I was a guy that in the past had, had uh, you know, said I thought Bruce Cassidy was a guy that should be on the Jack Adams every year just because, like, the team is more – they're obviously a very good team, but they're more than the sum of their parts. Or, you know, and then that is because of the play of some of their players. Um, you know, that the, they, they do have some really outstanding players who take things to the next level. And I thought Lindholm was deserving that, but obviously none of my colleagues did. Um, but I had Fox and I had Carlson. I mean, how do you not give credit to Eric Carlson? I mean, yes, playing on a terrible team, and you know, you can maybe have some doubts about how much of an influence he had defensively. But he is the sixth defenseman all time to put 100 points up in a season. I just couldn't ignore that. And then you know, Adam Fox has just been such a solid, impressive player every time you watch the Rangers play. Um, you know, I thought to give credit for him. I didn't actually have a vote this year for Kale McCarr. I thought, uh, I thought, you know, he obviously didn't play a full season. And, you know, I just like the rest of his team look, just look tired, you know, worn out from last year, a little hangover. But it's such a tough list. And I noted this in the little sorry story I wrote yesterday where I said, you know, Quinn Hughes is not a finalist. You know, you look at some of the other guys in that range that we, we do talk about. Yeah. We talk about Rasmus Dahlin. You talk, you know, who didn't, I don't you know, I don't know where he would end up, but you, you know, people have been talking about Brandon Montour. Like, you know, there's guys, there's so many guys that are in that range now. It is a real true golden era for a defenseman. You touched on it briefly. I, I'm just curious, uh, Kale McCarr, mm -hmm. uh, and whether you want to talk about him specifically or just the idea in general of availability. Uh, you know, he played 60 games. Yeah. Like, 
and yet he still is a finalist. So yeah. Clearly, in the minds of many, he is one of the best. And I think when healthy, there's no doubt yeah. he is one of the best defensemen. Yeah. But where do you sort of fall on that? And is there a number in your mind of, you know, how many games does a guy have to play to le- legitimately be a candidate for any of these awards? I think if he hadn't, if I, like I said, I, you know, I, if he hadn't sort of looked tired, I probably would have put him in there. It wasn't so much to me. I mean, 60 games, I feel like it's, you know, it's two or th- three quarters of the season. Like that I probably is the cutoff point for me. I don't know if I could vote for a guy that had only played 50. Obviously, you'd like to see 70. Um, right. But, but you know, he's so good. He, you know, there was such, he was so influential, obviously, when he played, even when he played, even if he wasn't his full self. Um yeah, I mean, I like I said, I, I debated it. I, I kind of, you know, I I, I, I did consult. I, I, I talked to a few people, see what they think, and I don't want to think that I know I know everything, but I try to, you know, so I try to put some effort into what I'm, what I'm doing with with my ballot. Um, but yeah, in the end, that was sort of one of those that you look at the guys he's up against, and and just the the, the, the impact. You know, yes, he was injured, and it's not his fault, you know, but the impact there were players that just had a little more impact this year than he did. But, you know, like I said, this is such an impressive group of candidates, um, you know, and it, to, to, to be sixth or whatever would have put them on my list is, is no, I mean, it's, it's, it's no shame in that. It was a tough decision. Right. Do you think the same things then apply to Elias Pettersson and the Selkie that, I mean, his game is trending in that direction, but the fact that he's sure. not one of the three best is not really a, mm. a knock on him. I mean, maybe he's the fourth best defensive player in the National Hockey League. Yeah, and it's one of those ones where you try to decide what is that trophy. You know, in many ways, I call it kind of a heart light. You know, like is, why isn't Patrice Bergeron in the discussion for the MVP? You know, you know, and uh, why do we say, oh, he's just that guy? He's a G eight to it. Like, I mean, you know, I gave Alex Barkov an MVP vote last year. Like, he was forever the kind of poor man's Bergeron, we call him Selkie guy, you know, it, it, it's, it's, some of these trophies have evolved in weird ways. I mean, best defensive forward, I think that's Guy Carbono, isn't it? Like a guy that just never leaves his many ultra, right? Like, isn't that what that is? But the game itself has evolved and, um, you know, so, uh, yeah, PD, I, I, uh, he, if I'm, yeah, no, I had him, I didn't have him in my Selkie, my Selkie ballot. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, a guy that certainly, you know, is going to be in the conversation. It is a fascinating thing to look at this season. You know, they had two guys that were at least in these conversations, you know, they're on the edge of it (laughs) and look how bad their year was. They didn't make it, you know, but what, what the, what the hell guys. And and PJ, there's an argument that if Thatcher Demko had had a Thatcher Demko type season, that he could be in this conversation for the Vesna as well, right? So, well, I mean, I was, I, I, yeah, I mean, you know, the Vesna is a GM vote, right? So it's not, that's, yeah. it, that's almost a more challenging one because sure. it's guys that are in, you know, I, I, I don't know what goes into their process. Obviously, they watch a lot of hockey. Um, you know, I, 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 I Demko is is a is an interesting one. Like I I sort of wrote a couple things last year when he was obviously such a story uh, for this team and and contemplated what would it take because you look at Shusterk and you look at Hellebuck, you look at uh, some of the other guys that are around, you know, and 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 uh, Vasilevsky, Soros. Like, Soros, right? Like four right there. Are you you know are you going to put him ahead of those guys? Yeah. Like can you actually do that? Um, and you know, I think he's close and certainly I really get a feeling you look at his season and the way he came back and it was a topic that, that we talked with him more than once about. Um, and he talked a little bit to me about it at my end of the season story that I wrote about him, uh, that, that, that he, I think recognized, first of all, he had a terrible first half. Uh, he probably gotten into his own head. I think it was the impression I gathered from him and then, and then also needed to, kind of reset himself and also become a loose looser sort of have a looser mindset if you will not be not that he's not focused but not be so sort of jammed up mentally and and really kind of dial dial in on on just enjoying himself and trusting himself and and taking his sort of mental game into a, a calmer level not being as stressed um and and i think that's going to be i mean I, that clearly i think is this this what I think he thinks going to be the key to success for him going forward. And, and so we'll see, you know, I mean, the way he played down the stretch, obviously uh, wore out a little bit, but the way he played down the stretch was the way a number one guy can be. 
and uh, and you need a guy to be, and then you're going to need him next year. So I got, you know, we'll see. It, it, it's a challenge. You look like I said, you look at that list of guys that he's up against, um, and it's it's a pretty steep. It's a st- pretty steep hill. I think I think getting on into the top three for Vesna is of all those trophies. Um, even even the heart baby is is the toughest hill to sled because there's you know the, the, those guys are all they're so con- the top guys are so consistent and then yeah. there's just so many guys trying to find their way. What about uh, Team Canada? Like we got Ethan Bear and Tyler Myers now on the blue line yeah. for at the World Hockey Championship. Yeah. Like Bear's going there without a contract, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. Of course, yeah. he's RFA, so he's still controlled by the Canucks. But yeah. what do you think, Tyler Myers? Sort of you know, angle is here because we all know about the bonus and where everything sort Mm -hmm. of stands. And, you know, Mm -hmm. some people expect that Tyler Myers could be on the move for the Canucks once they get out from underneath that bonus. But, you know, do you think that maybe he's thinking that way as well? Like, Hey, if I show well here, maybe I got a few more people sort of lining up for me. Yeah, I, I did. I did find myself wondering a bit about that. I did, you know, when, when I think it was Darren Drager initially sort of had Myers on his list, and I just wanted to make sure we were talking about Tyler Myers. So I emailed J.P. Barry, just saying, and he, he quite kind of bluntly replied, yes, he's going. And I was like, okay. And it, yeah, I, I think here's a guy, I mean, first of all, it, it was it was in many ways it was kind of I, I don't know I mean I shouldn't be surprised anymore. It's social media is terrible, but it was disappointing the number of people that just took this as a chance just to rip into him because I was like, yeah, he didn't have a very good year, and we said that. But you know what? He got asked to play for Canada, and like he said yes. And there's not a lot of guys that get to do that, and that's like that's a cool thing for him, despite everything. Now, you know. <laughs> does he need to once again, I think reimagine who he is. I think he does. I mean, maybe playing with the new coaches will make a difference. Um, but we'll see. I mean, and he's like, yes, there's that storyline. There's one year left. There's, there's a big contract. They really probably do need to get off the books and, and being able to show himself on a stage like that. Uh, you know, that, the, that, that there are a lot of pro scouts at, you know, that it is a tournament that, that, you know, they're not generally watching, you know, you're not generally getting guys watching Canada or the U S they're looking to see if there are diamonds in the rough in Latvia or Germany or some of the, you know, lesser lights of, of, that are in this tournament. Um, but how they handle against NHL type competitors. And, and, you know, so we, you know, we obviously saw Myers this season. Yeah. Can he, I, 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 I also kind of took it as a chance. Here's a guy, you know, nearing the end of his career. It's a chance to, do something he hasn't done in nine years. He hasn't been there since he was a young guy. Like he was, you look at that defense core that went to 2014, the world championships in 2014, which was an Olympic year. And it was all young guys. It was Eric Goodbranson was on that list. You know, it was you know, Kevin Bieksa was the old hand right. as the captain. Um, but a bunch of guys that were sort of being looked at, maybe they'll be in the mix for 2018 for the Olympics. If we go whenever we have a world cup or what have you. Um, and so, you know, that was the other thing I said, you know, everyone talks about what a great, event it is and and every player that gets to go talks about how much fun it is you know they they obviously you know they're there to win but they also get a little bit of a tourist experience they get to see a you know a european city they maybe haven't been to before um and just experience a bit of a different you know and, and getting that i think a little bit revisiting that sort of youthful making the select team tournament team kind of thing that experience again and well, it's team it Canada as, on your chest yeah regardless, and it's, right? team Canada, yeah. it's team Canada on your chest that's exactly it so I yeah I mean there 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 could be a showcase element and I thought about that but I you know as much as anything I thought here's a guy that's you know he's got three kids he's got a new 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 kids arrived and um and you know here's a here's an interesting adventure I don't know who's taking they always get to take some with them is is he taking are they taking the new one are they leaving kids at home is he taking his dad I don't know but uh yeah, I think more than anything, it's just a chance. I imagine it's more than anything. It's just a chance to put on the red jersey again one more time, at least. I tried to make the argument earlier on the pod uh, earlier this week that it's Andre Tournier as the head coach, Arizona's yeah. head coach, <laughs> yeah. DJ Smith, yeah. assistant coach, Ottawa, yeah. Tyler Myers was linked. So yeah. talk about showcase, <laughs> showcase for those guys. And uh, maybe yeah, they come maybe. home and, yeah. and make this yeah. argument that this is a player that they have to have. Tyler Myers yeah. on the big ice will be interesting, certainly. Uh, oh, boy. A little bit extra ground to cover <laughs> there. Uh, yeah. And for Ethan Baird, yeah. good for him. Uh, Connor yeah. Garland going for, for the Americans. Uh, 
we're here on this Friday, Monday, of course, is draft lottery day, 3% yeah. chance. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we've been down this road so many times with the Canucks and the lottery balls. Uh, where's your level of optimism, excitement, you name it, for the draft lottery on Monday night? Don't don't a- don't ask me about contests. Let's put it this way. When I, I, you know, all my years playing minor hockey, my brother playing minor hockey, the parents, you know, they do the 50-50 in the stands. And my parents, between my brother and I, all, you know, whatever, how many years it would have been, 20 plus seasons seasons uh, minor hockey they won once and uh there was a guy on my team when i was in grade seven who was his first year playing and his dad won four times and that was an early early lesson in uh the johnson family having no luck so we should i, I will buy the million dollar 50 50 when it's at a canucks game but other than that i avoid 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 so i don't know i mean you know but i i find i think a lot about whatever it was that average remember that run there where they just kept losing every year and that this was a team that had what was it the was it the worst or second worst record in the nhl and their average draft spot had been fifth right. or whatever it was and i just think about that and the look you know the trevor linden face and yeah i just i don't know that's what i think our Drant, the photo of Drant sitting there by the <laughs> snack table <laughs> you know things like that like i don't know i mean yeah it of course, it would be it would be game changing if they win the right to pick Connor Bedard. It would be massive. I just I'm realistic, I and mean, you know it's it's part of the life of being a Vancouver, sure you know, paying attention well, to Vancouver sports. Never it never works out, right? Get, you're up to to nothing in the final. It's not going to happen. Just stop, stop thinking about it. <laughs> well, PJ, uh, we spun the wheel five times. We went back and forth throughout the week. J. Pat and I. We got one more spin okay. on Monday. <laughs> Vancouver, four out of the five times finished where they should finish in eleventh. Yeah. Yeah. Second though, once. Second. So Ooh. when you think about Team Canada, uh, Adam Fantilli, yeah, perhaps go. Canuck yeah, fans, yeah. keep your eye on that guy. Yeah. I know everybody wants Bedard, but <laughs> that kid out of Michigan might be uh, oh, worth uh, getting boy. excited about as well. We'll see you exactly, though. We'll know on uh, Monday night. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, all right, guys. And in the five, <laughs> in the five, PJ, just so you know, Anaheim didn't land first once. No, we got well. Columbus twice. Yeah. And we got San Jose twice. Yeah. And then we got Washington to kick off the week. Well, I mean, <laughs> this is the thing. Like, you know, the, the weird the weird way the lottery's set up, they don't want tanking, but they've set it up. And they and so that means if you finish last, you actually have a 55% chance of not picking first. Right. Um, and, you know, I to me, I, like I wrote about the other day, that you know, the, among other things, they, I think the NHL would be smart to have a play in tournament, generate some fan interest for late in the season, create a bit more of a buzz, but also take the lesson from the NBA, just flatten the odds, and just don't don't create the scenario where guy teams are just trying everything can and and force teams force fans to cheer against their team. It just it was just so stupid, and I felt I did I, I felt bad for Canucks fans having to be in that position because there were all, there were fun things happening. They shouldn't be having to cheer against their team. Uh, All right, well, we save these broader ideas because we've got more podcasts <laughs> well, to come here. summer, I know. <laughs> <laughs> we can dig into that stuff. But for now, we'll yeah. let you uh, get back into the rain and uh, oh, yeah. enjoy you. your weekend, PJ. Thanks for joining. All right, catch you later. rink Vancouver is presented by Bodog. Make a play at Canada's Choice for free casino game sports odds and poker strategies. And uh, as we look at my Bodog best bet, J. Pat, uh, I had any time goal score in last night's Leaf game at uh, Ryan O'Reilly plus 190. Hit that. And the uh, the Leafs hit it early in this game. Really, they're up two buzz on the uh, Panthers. And then they just became the Leafs again. And they blew it. And they lose 3-2 to the Panthers. They also lose Matthew Nyes in a questionable play by Sam Bennett. There was a couple of questionable plays by Sam Bennett in this game. Are you surprised that Bennett just got a fine because it looks like nice perhaps could be done for the series with a concussion. Yeah, and let's make it abundantly clear that the fine wasn't for the play with Matthew Nice. Yeah, the the play was that was the cross check on bunting. You know, cross check to the head obviously has to be a penalty. And then I didn't like the you know bunting's down, and then another pretty good shot, uh, five grand at this stage of the proceedings. Uh, that's getting off awfully lightly. Um, yeah, and I didn't like the play behind the net. Uh, put Nyes in basically a, a hog tie and threw him to the icing. Yeah, that's dangerous stuff. And obviously concussions are uh, nothing to mess around with and not just, uh, I mean, it is his health first and foremost, but it's a big loss, obviously, to the Toronto Maple Leafs injecting this rookie that uh, they've been waiting for for a long time. He certainly hasn't looked out of place. He's uh, been productive and, you know, plays playoff hockey right off the, like a big body that plays that playoff style. So, 
Uh, yeah, things aren't going well for the Toronto Maple Leafs. And uh, give the Panthers credit uh, to withstand that start last night and yeah. come all the way back. And, you know, yeah, I'll say How it again. How about goalie I, Bob, too, right? Like, just... that's, like, that really is becoming one of the stories of these playoffs. Yeah. Like, uh, I mean, he looked like an afterthought and one of the worst contracts in hockey. And all of a sudden, now uh, this guy is a uh, fortress and, and getting the job done and, and seems to be building confidence as uh, he goes and the guys in front of him. And, you know, another day, another podcast, another mention of a defenseman scoring a goal because it just keeps happening around the National Hockey League. And Gustav Forsling uh, gets the game winner last night. So, uh, you know, you don't expect a ton of offense from him, although he was a 40-point guy in the regular season. It's nothing yeah. to sneeze at, uh, but a timely goal for him last night, and uh, Panthers uh, able to lock it down from that point on. So, uh, yeah, I mean, they're in a groove right now, right? Like, they, you know, come off the first round upset of Boston, and a lot of people thought, you know, maybe they're just going to exhale, and maybe that's as good as it's going to get for them. Instead, like, they've bottled what they had against Boston, and it was five straight wins for them. So, uh, yeah, they're feeling pretty good about themselves. Well, they had to get on a heater just to get in there, right? And they were able to ride that wave now. So, yeah, yeah 2 nothing series now for Florida. Uh, Dallas evened up the series with a 4-2 win over the Kraken. I love what Joe Pafelski is doing now. <laughs> <laughs> he just continues to score goals. I, again, uh, this Dallas team, I think a lot of people slept on them going into the playoffs here. Now they've evened things up as they head back uh, to the Emerald City. Yeah, but look, people that have been with us uh, through the regular season know that, like, I kind of question yeah. this Dallas team a little bit. Yeah. And, like, they got a win last night with nothing from their top line. Like, again, you know, Rope Hins was incredible in the first round, but he's been quiet through the first couple of games. Jason Robertson, you keep waiting. Uh, at some point, he'll get his. And I know he's picking up points along the way, but, I mean, this guy's one of the top goal scorers in the National Hockey League the last couple of seasons and uh, has built, been held in check for the most part. Uh, what I liked about Dallas last night, though, uh, you know, no apparent lingering effects of losing in overtime in the opener, came out, got the lead, built on it this time. Uh, Seattle hasn't scored first in either of these games after scoring the first goal in all seven games against Colorado. And, you know, last night, Dallas was able to extend to get it to 2 nothing. All of a sudden, at 2 nothing, you kind of take that Seattle team out of its comfort zone a little bit. they got to take a few chances. You know, they're missing Jared McCann still, so they don't have that, like, one-touch guy that the puck's on his stick. You know, there's a pretty good chance that it's going to go in the net. they got to do their scoring by committee. And, yeah, I mean, the committee produced a couple of goals last night, but uh, not enough to win the hockey game. So uh, Dallas looked pretty solid from the goaltender on out last night, like the start. And I just think if you can get the jump on Seattle, make them play uphill, yeah. and it's not just Seattle, it's anybody, but you know, it's so different than what happened in that first round. Colorado was never really able to shake Seattle, never able to kind of take them out of their comfort zone. And Dallas, I think, has been able to do that a couple of times. Credit to Seattle for getting the opener, but... Uh, yeah, I think Dallas has a fair bit to build on. Seattle's going home. They got the split. They're going to have the crowd all ramped up at uh, Climate Pledge. So uh, this one has the potential to be a pretty long series. And I say that uh, with all due respect to, to the Kraken, who, you know, the underdogs here. But uh, I think that they've shown that they can hang with the big boys and uh, nothing's going to be easy for the Dallas Stars here the rest of the way. Tonight's uh, game two between the Canes and the Devils. Of course, Carolina leading that series. And we're looking at that for my Bodog best bet tonight. I think uh, New Jersey is going to even things up tonight. It's basically a pick them. They're at minus 105. Carolina's at minus 115. So I will take New Jersey to even things up tonight. Uh, but I do like what I saw from this Carolina team. I mean, you know, this, they're, again, one of those teams that uh, everybody acknowledges as one of the best in the NHL. But I think when you sort of start picking Stanley Cup winners, they don't necessarily come up right away. They very well could be. But I think tonight the Devils even things up. With I have me. to, I got to think the Devils will be better than they were in the opener. And yeah. again, you know, maybe some of that was just coming off the high of eliminating their, their cross river rivals here, the Rangers, and didn't really get much time to breathe, whatever. They weren't good, but full credit to Carolina, taking advantage of home ice, making the most of it. Uh, they want to get up to nothing, so I think uh, you'll see the Canes ready to roll. But I just I have to think that the Devils uh, will put up more uh, resistance than they did in the series opener, and and that happens. Like you know, you're not going to be at the top of your game every single night out in the playoffs. It's a grind. Devils found that out the hard way. They also fell behind two nothing against the Rangers and came all the way back and won the series. So not discounting them, even if they do go down. 
but they don't have home ice this time uh, like they did in the previous round. And just a reminder, too, a bit of a weird weekend here now as yeah. we sort of split things up with the Stanley Cup playoffs tonight. Just the one game with Carolina and New Jersey. Tomorrow, the one game uh, with Vegas and Edmonton, and it's still a late start. And then three games on Sunday, Carolina, New Jersey, Florida, Toronto, Seattle, Dallas. So uh spread out weekend around the Stanley Cup playoffs. But of course... uh Although it looks like we're not going to have very good weather this weekend. So it's kind of thinking maybe you could get out and enjoy the sunshine. Not the case, at least today. Perhaps tomorrow we'll see you about Sunday. All right. Many thanks to uh, Patrick Johnson for joining us, as always, here on a Friday. This has been another edition of the Rinkwide Vancouver Podcast presented by Bodog. For Jeff Patterson, I'm Andrew Wadden. Remember, Rinkwide is the show that always supports.